in part two of this Truth Hunter series about alien symbols on craft and telepathic communication in binary code to humans from non-humans, we met U.S. Army Sergeant C.J. On June 30th, 2015, he and his family were stopped on a road near Wadley, Georgia. In front of them was a huge disc-shaped craft. Sergeant C.J. estimated it to be 820 feet long. Symbols at the craft's midsection were similar to other symbols seen by U.S. Air Force Staff Sergeant James Penniston on a black glassy triangle in Rendlesham Forest at RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge, England in December 1980. The same triangle with circles patterns was also reported in 1803 on a disc that emerged from the ocean in Japan. After encounters with UFO symbols, both Air Force Sergeant Penniston and Army Sergeant CJ experienced downloads of zeros and ones into their minds. Both described seeing the numbers moving right to left in their mind's eye as if on a screen. Sergeant Penniston said he consciously copied binary code from his mind onto pages in his flight notebook. At first, Sergeant C.J. was shocked to wake up in a Motel 6 bathroom, staring at the back of his letter-sized motel receipt, covered with squares and ones. He knew nothing about binary code, and he did not have any idea what the squares and the ones were, or how he got from asleep in bed to standing at the bathroom door with a ballpoint pen in one hand and the paper covered with squares and ones in the other hand. After his shock, Sergeant CJ remembered he had been having a vivid dream before he woke up in the bathroom. In the dream, there were tall, pale, gray non-humans wearing dark lenses over eyes that Sergeant CJ said were similar to human eyes, but larger. One being even took off one of his dark lenses and there was a crystal blue eye underneath. Sergeant C.J. learned telepathically that these beings described themselves as being from a cosmic council of five, like the Star Trek Federation. Sergeant C.J. heard thought voices in his head warn that Earth humans could be in danger, that the gray beings from the council of five were on a mission to more rapidly advance human knowledge and technology so that humans would not be so vulnerable to attack. Sergeant CJ told me in an interview that the Council of Five Non-Humans were, quote, doing what they can to try to help us. They are almost to the point where they are outnumbered and we're going to need to assist in order to survive, close quote. When I had Sergeant CJ's squares and ones translated with ASCII 8-bit binary code, there was a warning, quote, imminent threat soon upon Earth's leaders and civilizations. Expose and disband hidden knowledge to all citizens. Employ safe and controlled joint study to all minds. Progression imperative for combined survival Close quote. By February of 2016, Army Sergeant CJ had written down five new lines of binary code that turned out to be three Akkadian and two Sumerian ancient words that roughly translate as Nabu, an important Sumerian lord, on a horse or in a chariot going from or to the city of Larsa in southern Mesopotamia, today's Iraq, returning to Earth. On May 25, 2016, Sergeant CJ sent me an email that began, quote, woke up to go to work when I walked out to my truck. I saw three white oval-shaped orbs in the sky above me close by. I ran back to grab my iPhone to take a picture, but my phone would not zoom in. I don't know why the phone wouldn't work. Two weeks later, on June 8, 2016, Sergeant CJ woke up to write down four and one half lines of more squares and ones in his notebook that he keeps by his bed. 
At the end of those lines, he also wrote, could not keep up. He says, when the squares and ones are running in his mind's eye from right to left, that he has to focus very hard to keep them clear so he can copy them down before they are gone. Here is the ASCII 8-bit code translation of those June 8th lines. Your creator is D-I-S-P-L-E capital X. This is in the ASCII code followed by unknown and unknown and the letter Y and another unknown, meaning the zeros and ones. That D-I-S-P-L-E-X could have meant displeased. Three weeks after that, on June 19th, Sergeant CJ sent another email. Came into work early to receive first flight of soldiers coming back from Poland training. I was standing out in the field after I sent the soldiers to pick up bags when I spotted an odd anomaly in the distant sky. It came closer and I took a couple of pictures running back to my truck for protection. Then I was startled that the light was suddenly right over my head. And then almost immediately after that, two Black Hawk type helicopters came in fast pursuing whatever the light was. That same night of June 19, 2016, Sergeant CJ was receiving more binary code, but was only able to write down a few squares and lines, but wrote in his notebook that he could not stay focused. I was able to get the squares and lines translated, and there was one perfectly spelled word, arrogant, here are the squares and ones Sergeant CJ also wrote down in his notebook the same time as the dream. And below is the binary translation, belief as the word belief, followed by capital Q, L, L, O, W, the word all, space, three, one, space, 77745. Sergeant CJ said he could not stay alert to keep up with the moving squares and lines, which could explain why the second word is Q L L O W instead of A L L O W, which would be allow. And what is interesting, there is only one number difference in ASCII code between capital Q and capital A. Q is 0101 space 0001. A is 0100 space 0001. This may be an example of a human mind that is in a link with a non human intelligence that knows that some people can take binary code in zeros and ones into their minds and at least be able to retain it long enough to write it down, if not always completely accurately. All of the new binary code might relate to a vivid dream that both Sergeant CJ and his wife told me they had at the same time on the night of March 6, 2016. I dreamt that I was on the ground near houses and I recall seeing a bunch of people running away from something. And I saw them looking up in the sky. So I looked up as well. And I saw an oval shape. I remember a light coming down and I tried to run from it. And then I was immersed in it. What is this beam like? It was a bright white with blue inside it. I felt completely numb and paralyzed, couldn't move. And then at that moment, I was no longer there. And I remember there were different humanoid species. Not human. Not human. Well, besides one. The one that looked human was a male, late 40s, early 50s. And everyone referred to him as Colonel. He looked like an American to me. Slight receding hairline, light brown hair, brown eyes. He was wearing a dark blue jumpsuit, no patches, similar to what astronauts would wear on the space station. Dark navy blue jumpsuit with no identification or patches on the jumpsuit. There was a small gray alien in the room. There was a tall gray. 
Was the tall gray like those back on June 30th when you wrote the binary code? Yes, they appeared to be the same. There was a tall, human-looking, blonde hair species in that room, but I never got the impression that it was a human at all. It was a few inches taller than me, and I'm 6'1". There was a short female that also looked human, but not. She was about four feet tall. A characteristic I noticed, and that was a raised dark spot between her eyes, above her eyebrows. It looked like a swollen spot that was blue in color. Another one kind of looked like an incredible hulk, but not quite that big. Strong jaw, very rugged looking head, broad shoulders. You're describing a scene of some sort of collaboration between a U.S. government person and extraterrestrials. Why have the non-humans lifted you up in a beam and put you in a room with an American colonel who is immediately enraged? Yes, this colonel was very angry. They chose me to be there. He didn't feel that I needed to be there. He was upset that I was even there. He actually mentioned that I needed to be extinguished, which pissed me off. And I began yelling at him. I was hearing the tall gray talking in whatever language it was talking, but I was hearing it through telepathic. I could hear in my head, everyone was saying in clear English, but none of them were moving their mouths. They told the colonel that the reason I was there was because I'm not influenced by others from making decisions for me. And they mentioned that the colonel's group he works for has been infiltrated and are being arrogant. That group is being too arrogant to realize that they are blinding the American government from something important? Perhaps. Trying to do something that the aliens don't want? It could be. My impression is that the non-humans need us to come clean, come clean with what's going on, get everybody out of the dark. One of the most important parts of your notes about the March 6, 2016 event, quoting, the colonel was still angry and the aliens told him, you will remain, as if that one sentence indicates that the power is with the non-humans, not the American colonel. Yeah, that's the impression that I got as well. He's the speaker for our race in this meeting, and everyone else in this meeting is agreeing that I should stay. There has to be something important about why the non-humans would have the ability to counter an American Air Force colonel and do so with confidence that you would not be harmed. Yeah. If the government of the United States with the allies of World War II are the ones that are holding strict policies of denial for the whole world to not know that there are other life forms, and that our government has been working and collaborating with some since World War II while trying to fight or defeat others, a secret war. And now it appears that there is some intent by yet other non-human intelligences insisting that it is vital to humanity's survival for the truth to be opened up. There was numbers involved that were associated with Germany and there was an ancient thing that happened. In the 1500s, there was a battle of different craft in the sky over Nuremberg, Germany. And those were spears and crosses, weren't they? Yep, and long, dark craft. If there was a war between black triangles, spheres, and some sort of technology that looked like crosses, and that was in the 1500s. Now we're at 2016, and the implication is there is a war going on for some geopolitical territorial reason between non-humans and that somehow American humans are involved. Is it the same war? And if it is, what would be the war raging throughout millennia coming into various battles over what? I know, I'm right there with you, over what? I'd love to know. About which non-humans are allies and which are not, in September 2015, I interviewed retired U.S. Army Sergeant First Class Lynn Buchanan, who had worked as a controlled remote viewer for the Defense Intelligence Agency's DTS Intelligence Unit in Fort Meade, Maryland, next to the National Security Agency. 
Lynn told me about a project that he was tasked to remove view that divided the many different types of non-human intelligences interacting with Earth into four categories. Psychic grays that are friendly and like humans, psychic grays that do not like humans, non-psychic grays that do like humans, and non-psychic grays that do not like humans. That, he said, is the most dangerous category. I asked Lynn for more details about the hostile psychic ETs after he explained that he received firsthand knowledge about non-humans interacting with Earth during his official government work in classified black projects. There's not us and them. Everybody says, well, what do they want? Well, they want something different from what they want and from what they want, and you know, and so there's us and them and them and them and them. And each one is here with their own different agenda. After service, um, I was asked to do a study on the comparison and contrasting of ET psychic abilities with human psychic abilities. Um, I was given access to many things that the public will probably never see, but uh, in order to do this, and I came up with, uh, basically, you can cut all of them into four groups. And now the grays will be in each of the four groups, the insectoids will be in each of the four groups and all that. Um, because there are grays there and there are grays there and, and all that. But um, it turned out that they had friendly and unfriendly and in each of those two groups, you had psychic and non-psychic. And from the documentation that I got, I found out that the friendly, non-psychic ones come here for trade. I know the guy who's in uh, charge of the technology transfer, and he was laughing one day. He said, uh, they're not inventive people and uh, their culture is old and all that. They're not inventive people. And he said, uh, we get stuff from them. We play with it. We find all these different enhancements for it. And he said, these days we're trading them their stuff back to them and they're glad to get it. <laughs> they're here for trade. The non-psychic, non-friendly ones don't come here. Friendly psychic ones want to help us develop our abilities. And the non-friendly psychic ones want us wiped off the planet. They want us dead, period, to the, to the last human. And uh, I couldn't figure out what the motivation is for each of those two groups. And um, there was one event that happened that finally made it click. A uh, UFO came up and abducted these guys that were out camping at a lake. And um, uh, they watched it come up, you know, and it got over them and then they were, they froze. And it, well, it dawned on me from that and after reading all this other stuff that um, they, that group, has more psychic power than we do. But they have no range at all. We can see across the universe as easily as we can see across the room. Con the conclusion that I came to on this study was that um, as we get out into the universe, we have the psychic ability, we have the creativity, we have all that and we can be a powerful force in the universe. And that's why those friendly to us want us to develop that ability. And that's why those unfriendly to us don't want us out there. And so, um, and so this is my conclusion and that's what I wrote in the report. Our planet is now in the midst of its sixth mass extinction of plants and animals because of humanity's spread around the planet 
destroying and paving over so much ground that once sustained abundant Earth life. We're currently experiencing the worst period of die-offs since the loss of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Scientists estimate we're now losing animals, plants, and insects at 1,000 to 10,000 times the rate prior to the 20th century, with dozens of species going extinct every day. That means by the end of this 21st century, as many as 30 to 50 percent of all Earth species could be gone. Perhaps the non-human intelligences which watch this planet can see humanity's own future hanging in a balance, but will not allow humans to destroy the Earth. Perhaps that is why the aliens increase their interference at nuclear missile sites and human abductions despite aggressive government efforts to keep everything about the alien presence a big secret. One fact is certain. No matter who made humans or why, life on Earth is not guaranteed. But if the chokehold on the truth were released and the entire human family could know everything the governments and military are hiding about an alien presence, on this planet that still manipulates DNA and harvests Earth life, perhaps human tribal warfare would slow down in the alien concocted Garden of Eden where a reptile was the teacher. In November 1984, I was a speaker at the University of Nebraska with astronomer and QFOS founder J. Allen Hynek, PhD. That's the Center for UFO Studies. I presented about animal mutilations, and Dr. Hynek talked about UFOs. Afterward, he said to me, Linda, let's let our hair down with each other. I thought, wow, I'm going to learn what Alan Hynek really knows about UFOs and ETs. We went to a quiet room away from the conference buzz, and to my surprise, he began with, the most important book I have ever read and hope that you will read too is Theosophy by Rudolf Steiner. In that book, first written in 1922, Steiner summed up his understanding about the relationship between the human mind, body, its soul, and animating life force spirit. In the soul, the eye flashes forth, receives the impulse from the spirit and thereby becomes the bearer of the spiritual human being. Humans are rooted in the physical world through physical body, ether body, and soul body that come to flower in the spiritual world. The stock, however, that takes root in the physical body and flowers in the spirit is the soul itself." Close quote. Neither J. Allen Hynek nor I knew that he would pass into another dimension only a year and a half later from a brain tumor. And I would not learn from abductees about the ET soul transfer technology for seven more years in 1991, when abductee Linda Porter sent me her sketches of the human soul life force radiating gold orange light as it moved from the dying man's body into another body cloned by rapid cycle cloning in what the abductees call resurrection tubes, managed by a gray, ebon, and praying mantis beam. Military voices have made it clear to me that there is a secret war on Earth, one group, of other intelligences want to see humans evolve into consciousness with the divine field that is responsible for all matter worlds. Another intelligence wants to stop human evolution so it can continue to harvest us genetically for its own self-serving purposes. Maybe like political factions, the dark party and the light party are competing over legislation to legalize the production of cloned android life outside the force of creation's recycling program of a finite number of souls. Maybe some souls are captured and put into cloned bodies, 
which is fouling up the divine field's process. Other clones might never receive souls. That political issue about cloning for galactic trade or alien wars might explain why dramas of resurrected saviors from Osiris in Egypt to Christ in ancient Palestine, Israel today, have been presented repeatedly to humanity. Osiris and Christ were beings with human bodies and mysterious divinity who emphasized that death in the body does not end life for the soul and the spirit. That concept underlies the Egyptian obsession with mummies and sacred rites to protect the soul at the moment of death from competing forces. If there is a finite number of souls as the government whistleblowers that I call Sherman say, and they are under a strictly regulated God force recycling program, then clone bodies and androids might end up outside excluded from that recycling process. The full scope of the complex multi-layered chess game for souls, spirits, and bodies of humans, extraterrestrials, angels, and time travelers might be beyond human ability to understand. One scientist in New England, who has also been abducted by gray beings, who repaired his diseased heart, told me that he was shown holograms that depicted a series of universes in pairs. Mirrored images, each the opposite of the other, from the subatomic to the macro. He says, quote, our universe is paired to another universe, which is completely opposite of this one. There, the skies are glowing white with dark suns. Colors are indescribable and iridescent. Time flows to the past. Like a conveyor belt at the moment of death in our universe, we move through a tunnel into the mirror universe where it is all light. There, time moves to the past and souls return back here in this universe, close quote. Perhaps the unique isolation that each human feels and the peculiar melancholy that a dark sky filled with stars can evoke have something to do with knowledge buried in our genes and our souls. A sensing of ancient intimacies with other beings and other worlds. Now in this time of revolution, when the whole world will know we are not alone in this universe. Our greatest challenge as a species will be to stand up unafraid before the old gods and watchers. Ultimately, there is a common bond among all life forms ebbing and flowing on spirals of different frequencies supported by a singular force, an invisible matrix of energy from which everything emerges and to which everything returns. This is Linda Moulton Howe. Please stay tuned to my Gaia series for more revelations about our universe, the solar system, and the planet we live on.